talk about the principles of power. This is a good topic for us. We've been talking about all kinds of things, but one of the things that I want us to talk about is how we get the Holy Spirit, how does He come into our lives, and what does He give us when He comes in? You know, I think the disciples sort of asked that kind of a question when Jesus was with them. Because when Jesus walked with them, they were fine. But when he started talking about leaving them, and he started talking about the Holy Spirit, giving them the comforter, the Holy Spirit, they didn't know what to do with them. And so they really weren't sure what he would do. And so uh, it, it, it became a dramatic thing for them. But 50 days after Passover, they found out on the day of Pentecost, which is the day, which is the Feast of Weeks in the Hebrew calendar, uh, they found a great moving of the Holy Spirit. I thought it was kind of interesting that the Holy Spirit would come during the Feast of Weeks where they celebrated the harvest. And so then it becomes natural when you think of why the Holy Spirit came on that day, the abundance harvest that He was going to bring into the church. And you'll recall that day 3,000 people were added to the church in that single day. Now, I don't know of any church outside of the Grand Crusade, I don't know of any church that's had 3,000 people in one day. Do you? Never have known of it since then. That's the remarkable thing about it is. But, uh, and the church grew from there. The church in Jerusalem grew. It was a mighty force for the people to contend with. It was probably by the time, uh, 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 I think, uh, which of the apostles took over the Jerusalem church? James? Well, yeah, when uh, James took over the uh, the uh, the church in Jerusalem, it was about probably 10, 10, 15, 30,000 people that made up that church in Jerusalem. It was a mighty force to contend with during those days. But uh, And so we're going to look at this power because the subtitle tells it all. Understanding our source of strength in a world gone crazy. Now, do you think the world's gone crazy? Yeah, the world's gone really crazy. And sometimes we just pray for civility, we pray for calm, we pray for peace. But the only way that's going to come is with the coming of the Holy Spirit and how He enters into our lives. It's so important. Our text today is going to be Acts chapter 2. We're going to be looking all the way down to verse 39 before we finish. But let's begin with Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. When the day of Pentecost, that is the Feast of Weeks, had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, that's, that word suddenly is an important word. It means uh, they weren't expecting it. They, they were just uh, uh, having a prayer meeting and they weren't expecting what was about to happen. It came on them all of a sudden. They were not prepared. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise. This is not just a little noise. This is like an earthquake kind of noise. It was, it was, a, it was a tremendous noise. And I could imagine it, that it took most of them to, to their knees. They may have already been on their knees, but if they weren't, they took them to their knees. It was a noise that was almost unbearable, like a violent, rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there were, appeared to them uh, tongues of fire. Now that's in this, uh, this uh, New American Standard. Uh, there is a translation, maybe it's uh, King James, that says cloven tongues of fire. It, it, was, uh, it, 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 it was tongues of fire that spread through the whole group. Nobody was excluded from it. Everybody was covered with it. And, it. and distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Now, we have to be careful here. Our Pentecostal friends would say that this is the tongues in, 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 in the Corinthian church. It is not. This word is dialectus, which means dialects. Tongues of dialects, where they were translating and as the Spirit was giving them utterance, so they were speaking other languages, other languages. Now there were living in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven, and this sound occurred. The crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing in his own language. That reinforces what it said in the previous verses, uh, in their own dialect. And uh, they were all amazed and astonished, saying, "Why are not all these who are speaking Gal Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how it is that we hear each of them in our own language to which we were born: Parthians, Medes, uh, Elamites, 
and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Christians and Arabs, we hear them in our own language speaking of the mighty deeds of God. That's how broad this was. If you were in Jerusalem at that time, you heard it in your language, no matter what it was. That's how broad it was. And they all continued in amazement and with great perplexity. Don't you think this would sort of amaze everybody? <laughs> would you be amazed? I would. They were amazed and they were perplexed with great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. But Peter, making his stand with the eleven, raised his voice, declared to them, men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem, and let it be known to you, and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, says God, that I will pour, out my, pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men dream dreams, and even on my bond servants, both men and women, I will in those days pour, out, pour forth my spirit, uh, and they shall prophesy. Now this word prophesy is an interesting word. Uh, a lot of people will use it to give a pr prophetic word to people. That's not what this means. This just simply means to proclaim. Proclaim, that's what it means. They shall proclaim. And they shall prophesy the coming of the Lord. The Lord has already come. And so they're going to proclaim it to those that are listening. Therefore, let all house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both, both Lord and Christ. It's Jesus whom you crucified. So he puts the blame where it is. He said, you crucified him. <laughs> you did. He came to you as a Messiah and you wanted him dead and you got that. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And that's important, uh, being pierced, that it penetrated. It penetrated all the way to the inner part of their being. And, uh, Simon, and Peter said to the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Uh, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, each of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift. He doesn't say the gifts. It says the gift, it is singular. What is the gift? The Holy Spirit. That's the gift. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Now, there, uh, we, we have the coming of, of uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit to the people of that day. It's a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit. Every man's hearing his word. And, and the whole purpose was evangelism. That was the whole purpose. There are two words that were used primarily in the early church. One was the kerygma. The kerygma was evangelism. That was their primary word. Evangelism. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He died for the sins of man. He was buried for three days. Uh, and he rose from the grave. That's the kerygma. That's what they evangelized. The other was the didache. In Acts 2.42, that's what's taking place. It says, And those that, that believe were baptized, but they sat at the apostles' feet and listened to them. They listened to the apostles' teaching. That's the dedicate. They were teaching them all they could learn about Jesus and how Jesus transforms their lives and makes them new. Two primary words. But there are five spectacular reasons why we preach the gospel today. So we need, we need to take this from that day into this day. How do we do that? Five reasons for the gospel today. Our mandate has not changed. You, you remember in Matthew chapter 28, it says that the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain that Jesus had designated for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. And Jesus said, all authority has given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's evangelize. Go and, and tell them about me. Our mandate has never changed from day one. It's always been the same. We are to teach them. We are to develop them. We are to baptize them. 
they are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. All these things that still our mandate has never, never changed. If, 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 if somebody in your church says, well, our mandate has really changed. We need to have more of a social gospel than a religious gospel. That's wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Our mandate is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. No other. Okay? Secondly, our master has not changed. We still have the same Lord and Savior. His name's Jesus. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. He's always the same. So when you go down life and you look at someone who needs Christ, you can declare this Jesus that you worship has never changed. His promises are always the same. His ability to intervene in their lives is always the same. He has never changed. Then our message has not changed. That's what Jude chapter 3 or Jude verse 3 tells us all the time. We don't need a new gospel. We just need to preach the gospel we have. And that's important. We need to get the gospel out to people who are in need. The message is always the same. Always the same. Then our methods have not changed. Mankind has not changed. He's always been totally depraved. That is correct in every way. Excuse me. Our methods for getting the gospel out has changed. But this method of mankind being changed has not changed changed at all it's still the same jesus is still in the re in the securing business he always has been always will be that's why he came he said for this purpose i came i came to seek and to save that which was lost he came to depraved humanity to redeem him so he could take him to heaven with him and then uh, oh and so we share the message through prayer this is how we share it through prayer uh, through a Holy Spirit anointing. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes on you. He gives you an anointing that you can share with other people uh, by sharing the message with other people, by witnessing, telling them about Jesus. You know what witnessing is. The old time preachers used to say it this way. Witnessing is one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. That's it. Where did you get your life? Where did you get your hope? Where did you get your peace? Where'd you get your joy? Where'd you get your comfort? Where'd you get all these things that has come into your life since Jesus has been your Lord and Savior? So we get it that way. Uh, we do it through soul winning. Uh, we witness the, the acts of God in our lives, but we win souls. The, the, the writer of Proverbs says that he who wins souls is wise. And we need to understand that. If, we're, if we don't win souls, we can't be wise. We have to win souls to the Lord. That's so important. And then giving. We share the message through giving. When you give to your church, they send the money out around the world, however it's used, and that propagates the gospel message. Do you realize back in the, I guess, uh, 1800s, what was uh, Lottie Moon, uh, uh, when, when she was a missionary to China, they did not, uh, the uh, Southern Baptists didn't want to support her because she was a woman. She violated the, the Bible according to what many believe. But she stayed true. And, but it's through her ministry and the things that she taught us that you came up with uh, the Light and Moon Christmas offering. You remember that? How many of you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And other mission organizations do the same thing. They have mission groups and mission organizations that give to missionaries. And we, as we give to those, that's how we lead people. Flora and I are active not only in our tithing to our church, but we also tithe to other organizations and ministries. About 20% of our income goes to ministry. And we like it that way because they're doing the work of God. Now, if you're out there working for the glory of God, but you're not witnessing to people, you're not getting people saved, we're not going to support you. We only support those ministries that do evangelism. That's what we're called to do, evangelism. Now, ministry is good, but that's not our ministry. Our ministry is to evangelize. And so we support organizations that do evangelism. So these are important for us. And we do it by loving people. Loving is so important. When you love your neighbors, you love friends, you love family, you're able to open up the doors of opportunity to them. And then five, mankind has not changed. He's always been totally 
depraved. You know what I mean? It seems worse today than ever before. But I don't think it is. I think mankind is totally depraved. He has been from the beginning. And so we have to deal with this. We have to reach as many people as we can. Here's a life principle. It is an insult to God to say we cannot have revival. That's an insult to God. Why? Romans 5.20. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And then 1 John 4.4. 4, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. So yes, we can have revival in our world. If we're just persistent, if we're prayerful, if we keep doing the work of God, revival will come. Okay, and so the answer to all this for the church was God sending His Holy Spirit. That's it in, 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 in a nutshell. I don't care if you're a Trinitarian or a non-Trinitarian, everybody believes in the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that's so important. It's central to the truth of the church. It's central. So how does this help us? Well, first, God was demonstrating His power. Remember in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the remotest part of the earth. That's where the power comes from, from the Holy Spirit. And without Him, there is no power. you got to have it. Now, for many years, I didn't really support that idea. I really thought it was more than that. But basically, that's what it comes down to. The power we, we receive is from the Holy Spirit. Secondly, it happened on the day of Pentecost. The God sent His Spirit happened on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Jewish, uh, the, uh, Jewish Passover. That's a, uh, and it, it's a Jewish feast today, the Feast of Weeks. God invites us not to a famine, but to a feast. He invites us to share the feast with Him. And that's, his, that, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we go in the power of the Holy Spirit, demons flee. They flee from us. They cannot oppose us. We just keep going. All the more. Number three, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would come and His disciples were commanded to wait for the fulfillment of the promise. Now, they didn't want to. You need to know that. Acts, if Acts chapter 1 tells you anything, they wanted to get going. They wanted to get out there and start preaching, but Jesus told them to wait. They had to wait till the promise of the Holy Spirit came. He never told them when He was coming. He never told them how He was going to come. He never told them what they were going to do when He came. It was automatic. When the Holy Spirit came, they immediately went out to the streets and began to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what they did. Now, look at our churches today. Let's do a little comparison. In the early church, when the disciples were in the upper room, they looked sort of like our churches today. They didn't do a whole lot. But when the Holy Spirit came on them, they were forced out into the streets. Today, we don't have much movement among our churches. Not much. And why? Because we've played down the role of the Holy Spirit. We need to increase the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives and let Him do the work that He wants to do. Jesus had promised the Holy Spirit would come and His disciples were commanded to wait for the fulfillment of that promise. They were commanded to wait. Maybe sometimes we just need to wait. Wait for Him to come again. To come into our lives. The abiding miracle of Pentecost, the abiding miracle of Pentecost is that men and women were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the whole idea of Pentecost. Pentecost is a Christian tradition. Feast of Weeks is a Jewish tradition. But we, 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 uh, we practice Pentecost because it just simply means 50 days after, after uh, uh, Passover. And then... Five, human beings can now become inhabited by the Holy Spirit. You absolutely receive the Holy Spirit when you give your life to Christ. You receive Him. Now, you can have more of Him as life goes along, but you receive Him. 
And when you receive him, you inherit the ability to do the things that Jesus wants you to do. And as you do some things, you get to do more things. As you do more things, you wind up doing even more things and more things and more things and more things. That's what he does. That's what he does in our lives. So the coming of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is simply this. The coming of his power is symbolized. Acts 2, 2, uh, two to 3. And suddenly there came a noise from heaven like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves as they rested on each one of them. I sort of <laughs> get a little humorous with that because I can imagine these tongues of fire landing on top of their head and singeing their hair. I can just see that, but that's not what it was. But, it's, but it was just the coming of the Holy Spirit upon their lives. Then the coming of His power is vocalized in Acts 2, 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. When the Spirit came upon them, they vocalized what was happening, what was occurring in their lives. And that's so important to the church. Okay? Now, there are three ways the Holy Spirit was vocalized. The first, the disciples spoke in other tongues. They spoke different dialects. People have that gift. They can do that. I meet with people who go around the world who can speak many languages. My translator in Alphanus, Brazil, spoke seven different languages. She was fluent in seven different languages. And she, uh, but that was her gift. She could speak many languages. I'm just gifted to do what I do. Uh, the, 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 the translation, is, that's floor. That's not me. Anyway, they spoke different languages. The sign was a sign of, uh, was, was to unbelieving Jews. That's why the, the tongues was used was to get the attention of the unbelieving Jew. Acts 4, I mean, 1 Corinthians 14, 21, 22 is very important to us in that. It, it speaks that the gift of tongues was for the unbeliever, not for the believer. And it affected all in Jerusalem who witnessed it. Everybody who witnessed that was affected by it. Everybody. And so when we are, we give the word unto the Holy Spirit, people are affected by that. That's why the Bible can say, that the word of God return, will not return void, but will enter into the hearts of individuals and it will grow there. A seed will be planted. So the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts, <laughs> I don't know what happened here, <laughs> but uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit is actualized. Now it's symbolized, it's vocalized, it is actualized. And that's so important for us. The Holy Spirit is a, pro is a promise to receive. The Holy Spirit is a power to be released. And the Holy Spirit is a person to be recognized. That's it in a nutshell. That's what he does in every way. When a church demonstrates the power of the Holy Spirit, three things happen. One, there will be, uh, there, there will be amazement. It says in this passage that everybody was amazed. Not just some of the people, but everybody was amazed. How about that? When was the last time you went in, in, into a church and spoke and everybody was amazed? Well, for me, it's been a long time, if any. <laughs> but th that's just the way it is. People were, are amazed at the gospel. Uh, uh, there will be amusement. There's not only amazement, but there will be amusement. Some laughed and some mocked. That's verse 13. Some laughed, some mocked them. But then there will always be an acknowledgement. Some people will acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. Those that believed, those that rece believed, received the word, and they were baptized, 3,000 people that day. Now, there were more than that there. But 3,000 people believed. That's a good number. That's a good harvest to reap in anybody's calendar. And so it, it talks about 3,000 souls, about, that's a roundabout figure. It's probably, it, it, it may have been more because the only people that were really counted were the men. 
I'm sorry, ladies, but that's who was counted. The men were counted. But the Apostle Paul, I mean, the, uh, the Apostle Luke is just sharing that about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls received him. So there were more than that. So here's a question. Are you ready for them? This is going to blow your socks off. One, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? That's a good question. Do you know Jesus personally? If not, you can, the Bible says you can pray to Him today and ask Him to come into your life, and He will do that and fill you with the Holy Spirit. Call upon Jesus today, repent, turn from your sins, turn to Jesus, ask Him to forgive you of your sins, and acknowledge Him as the Lord of your life, because that's the principle of power. That's how you get it. 